Sun Prairie United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us for worship online in this first weekend of June. My name is Amanda Hinthorne and I'm the Director of Christian Education and it's a blessing to be able to gather together in this very special way. Whether you're a member or a friend or a visitor to this faith community, we welcome you and we're glad that you've decided to join us for worship. If you are a first time worshiper with us, please know that we are a church that extends our welcome wide. We believe we are on a journey of loving and serving God together and growing and serving each and every one of our neighbors. We appreciate knowing that you're in worship today. So please take a moment to register your attendance on the church website where you clicked to join worship. If you're visiting with us online, we hope that you'll also take time to register your attendance so that we can know who you are and where you're joining us from. We want to invite you to get ready for a time of worship wherever you are today. If you have a candle, we want to invite you to light it as a way to remind you that this is worship and God's presence is with you. If you have your Bible with you, we invite you to follow along with our scriptures and readings. It is good to be able to share together in this very special time of worship from wherever we are and with whomever we are with. Welcome to worship. My name is Jenny Arneson, and I serve as the lead pastor here at the Sun Prairie United Methodist Church. And today we will also share in communion, so I invite you to have bread and juice or water ready when we come to that portion of the worship service. And if you need a moment to collect those things, I invite you, if you're worshiping online, to just hit the pause button, and you can go gather your items and come back to worship. Well, now we begin our worship as we do each time we gather for worship by pouring water into our baptismal font. And as we do that, as the water is poured out, we are reminded of the unity of God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is one God, one faith, one baptism. May we remember our baptism and be thankful. And now we have gathered where we are for worship, to come into God's presence and to offer back to God our hearts, our minds, our lives, and our attention as we give God our gratitude and praise. Let us worship together.
Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Brad Mother, and I'm the Director of Caring Ministries. Let us pray as we begin our time of worship together. Loving God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, you have shown us what is good and what you require of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. We see the pain and injustice afflicted on others, and we don't know what to do. We want to love you and care for our neighbors to be part of reshaping our communities. So in the midst of it all, we gather where we are for worship. We worship you as the God who calls for compassion and justice and who desires nothing less than peace for the world. We worship you as a God whose grace and love knows no end. May it be so as we worship and as we live. Amen. The scripture passage comes to us from Matthew's Gospel. Listen for the word of God as I read from the 28th chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone, it's Mrs. Banley here for Children's Time. I am so excited to be outside on my back porch, feeling a little bit of wind coming through on this beautiful day. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about two things. One is Pentecost, which is that wonderful season of the Christian year where we celebrate Jesus going back up to heaven to be with God something really, really neat happened before he made that ascension to be back up with God. All of a sudden, people were gathered from all around who spoke different languages, had different color skin, came from different places. But the amazing thing was they could all understand each other. And the reason I believe they could understand each other is because they all shared the love that brings us together. I'd like to share a story with you today called Love Can Build a Bridge. And this actually is a song that was written by a country recording artist named Naomi Judd. And she decided that this was so important that everyone hear the words of her song, but also see the pictures that go with it to help us during these hard times when there's people who aren't getting along, who maybe have a different color skin than someone else, speak a different language, but because of love, we can all come together and help each other out during these hard times. I want to challenge you to be a part of building God's love bridge. That means that you take time for everyone. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here together today to know that we all can make a difference. We can be that bridge God wants us to build when we show our love. Amen. Now please join me in the prayer God taught us the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For this week and next week, our worship focus will be on 
being challenged by difference. And today we will consider the challenges we face by differences of race and racial disparity and the sin of racism that has been brought to light again by the current COVID-19 pandemic and the recent killing of more black lives in our country. Next week we will be celebrating being a reconciling church and we will talk together about the challenges we face of differences of sexual orientation and gender identity and the ways that we extend our reconciling welcome, regardless of age or mental health or physical ability. This is a lot to take on, and obviously we will only scratch the surface in our short worship message. But hopefully, it will be the start of continued conversations for us as a faith community. It will be the start of conversations. It will be the start of continued prayer. It will be actions that push us to, together, be able to look at the larger conversations and to look at the storylines of how we live together in our communities and in our country. Earlier, we heard the scripture from the Gospel of Matthew that has Jesus saying, Go, therefore, and make disciples. We call that the Great Commission. Now I'm going to continue reading more of the Pentecost story that we heard the beginning portion of last week. And in this season of Pentecost, this story offers us some helpful, helpful challenges, but also some helpful understandings of how we live together with our differences. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to follow along with this story that I'll be reading from the second chapter of the book of Acts and the first 18 verses. And I'll be reading from a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. Listen now to a word of God. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force, no one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks, and they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout pilgrims from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. Then when they heard it, one after another, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our various mother tongues? They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked, they're drunk on cheap wine. That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I will pour out my spirit on all those who serve me, men and women both, and they will prophesy. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Make your way into our hearts with these words of Scripture. Then empower us to speak and to act so that we may come alongside others to share the good news of your love in real and understandable ways. Amen. Well, we are in the first week of June, which means we are five full months into the year 2020. And we're moving toward the halfway point of the year. There are days when I wish we could start 2020 over again. Start again in a new way. In golf, we would call it a mulligan. We would take a mulligan. Or in computer terms, we would say we want to install the year again. When we rang in the new year on January 1st, 2020, none of us could have predicted what would have happened by midway through the year. 
By early March, we had been in continual, continual political unrest and divide, and we were full-blown into a global pandemic called the coronavirus. Last week, we passed the 100,000 mark of American lives that have been taken, killed by the virus. Then in the last month, we have seen and heard more killings of black lives. And now we are living in the midst of the ravages of the virus, both the Corona-19 virus that has attacked bodies and minds, and now we are in this virus called racism, which also attacks bodies and minds and hearts. Both viruses have revealed this underlying an embedded sin of racism, which is in our country, in our culture, these inequities with race in our culture, and the systems of racism that are woven into the fabric of our culture have been revealed once again. When we reflect on the recent brutal killing of George Floyd while in police custody in Minneapolis and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery in Georgia by two white men, while he was out jogging, and the police killing of Breonna Taylor in her home by mistaken identity, I hope we can all say, I hope we can all say that there's something seriously wrong in our country. Most people are legitimately trying to understand all that is going on right now. And I know most of you are praying and searching and asking the questions, what can we do? What can we do and how can we be part of the solution instead of being part of ongoing problems? One of the first steps to better understanding, acknowledging things that are happening in our country, is to acknowledge the scenarios that are happening now are scenarios that have been happening before. They are scenarios that have happened over decades and even centuries. Scenarios like unjust killing of black people, or a health crisis that disproportionately affects people of color because of economic inequity, or lack of proper access to health care, or the fact that so many people of color work as essential workers in the service and hospitality and caregiving industries, and they don't have the option to work from home, or even to have sometimes paid sick days. All that is happening among us in 2020 are symptoms of a deeper problem. They may be things that we have never seen. They might be things that we don't experience in our neighborhoods or in the family and friend circles that we travel in. But they are things that are happening to people around us. They are things that are happening to our brothers and sisters in our country and in our world. One of the basic tenets of our faith that we teach to our children and our youth within our church ministries is that each one of us is a child of God. Each one of us is a child of God, and we will treat each other as such. In other words, we are all created in the image of God, and we will treat others as we would want to be treated. I can't imagine many people not agreeing with that plumb line of our faith. But it's the living it out that gets difficult. It's how we live that out, that out that gets difficult. And it's hard to live out in our daily lives because we are challenged by our differences. We also have different biases. We all carry a set of biases, whether they're good or bad. All of us have good biases about people that we know and love. We also have bad biases about people who are different from us. We have certain ideas about wealthy people, poor people. We have certain ideas about people that live in certain neighborhoods in our communities. We have certain feelings and images that come to our mind when we hear the words liberal or conservative or evangelical. We have certain ideas about other religions or people that own guns. We all have biases, and we all need to learn from our biases. All of us learn along the way these biases, and sometimes we don't even know where they come from. Yet all of us need to 
deal with our biases that we either learned in childhood or from people that we work with or the social circles that we engage in or from the news networks that we listen to or the social media circles that we frequent. We all have biases, both good and bad. And often those biases exploit our fears. When it comes to race, none of us wants to be thought of as a racist. Racism is incompatible with Christian teaching. It is incompatible with the God of creation. It is incompatible with the love of Christ. And it is incompatible with the power of the Holy Spirit. Yet differences can make us uncomfortable. Differences in conversations that we have with people who are different from us can make us uncomfortable. Race conversations can make us uncomfortable. So we try to justify things in our minds. When we see pictures or videos of someone being treated unfairly or even killed, we sometimes wonder what happened leading up to those events. I've asked those same questions myself sometimes. And then I have to check myself. I have to check myself and ask myself, what are the biases that I have that would make that the first question I ask? With the killing of George Floyd in recent days, that kind of question simply does not matter. The man was killed by the power of another human being who was in a position of authority and who was in a role to serve and protect. No one, die, no one deserves to die while being arrested. And certainly we would not want that for ourselves, and we certainly wouldn't want that for anyone in our family. And it really is not about police hating people who are different from them. Like the rest of us, police also have a challenge of difference. They're challenged by their differences. And there are some police that should not be in the policing profession. But the majority of police officers, the majority of police officers got into their profession because of their passion to help and to serve and to protect others. Many of you know Kevin Konopecki. He and his family are active members here at the Sun Prairie United Methodist Church. Kevin serves as one of our confirmation mentors. He serves as one of our worship readers. He serves as a greeter. And he serves on one of our fellowship serving teams. Kevin is also a lieutenant with the Sun Prairie Police Department. And he's the liaison officer and coordinator of our public safety chaplain ministry. I had the chance to sit down and talk with Kevin earlier this week and appreciate his insight, both as a police lieutenant and as a person of faith. Take a listen as he talks about the killing of George Floyd and the commitment to building relationships within our community and community policing. Um, we need to work together uh, in the community with all, everybody in the community, uh, wh whether it's citizens, uh, community organizations, uh, other agencies, what have you, um, we need to, to work together to solve problems. And that means you, can, you continue to have you know, dialogue with everybody in the community. Um, we want Sun Prairie to be a very safe place for everybody, all races, creed, religions, sexual orientations, what have you, when they come to Sun Prairie. And this should be for every community. Um, and that's challenging, but, but especially here in Sun Prairie, we, we live by this, is that when you're, you choose to work or live in Sun Prairie, you are going to be protected uh, by a police department that you can trust uh, and is going to empower everybody in the community to have that quality of life. And so we take a lot of pride uh, in, in that, and we are constantly engaging. Um, you know, we tell our officers, get out of the squad. The best thing that you can do is get out of the squad car and, and interact with, with people that you see at the park, walking, what have you. The, the video made me sick to my stomach, it absolutely sick to my stomach. We saw a life get lost on, on camera, and, and what was absolutely horrible about it, it was that person was in the care of a police officer. And I, I felt a lot of rage, uh, and I felt sickness, just, just absolutely sick to my stomach. Um, George Floyd never, ever should have died in that officer's custody. And, and, that's, and, I, and I felt a lot of anger. Uh, I felt a lot of anger. Um, I got into uh, the policing profession for the nobility of policing 
where you are there to protect and serve your fellow man and woman. Uh, and uh, I got in to do exactly that. I, I want to help and protect everybody uh, that lives in the community that I police and in the community that I live. And what that officer did um, to destroy uh, what the nobility of policing is uh, was just absolutely horrible. It, it was abhorrent and it was horrible. And I, you know, and uh, so when somebody's crying, and that, that, that's the other part that just really hurt me and, and and made me so upset is this this poor gentleman George Floyd is is begging for his life asking for help <laughs> that's what you do is you help people he's asking for help he's telling this officer he's pleading I need help and for that officer to completely ignore him and not do anything that that is not what the policing profession is about it, it just isn't and that's not how we police that's not how I police you know that's not how any of the men and women in, in the Sun Prairie Police Department police that's not what anybody and whoever works as a police officer throughout the world, that's not what policing is about. I want to bring us back to the scripture and allow this passage of scripture to offer us some insight about what we can do when we are challenged by our differences. At Pentecost, the Spirit of God touched those gathered, and suddenly, suddenly they began to speak in languages as the Spirit gave them ability. They were describing their experiences of God. And each person, regardless of their land of origin or their race, heard the message in their own language, in their mother tongue, and they could understand it. Perhaps this is one of the real gifts of Pentecost, the gift of understanding. It is clear in our story today that this extremely diverse group of people were overcome with something powerful, and something wonderful. And in the midst of that power and that wonder came the gift of understanding. The late pastor and theologian Peter Gomes once wrote that at Pentecost, the gift of understanding did not diminish the diversity of that great crowd. The people did not become less than they were. They became more than they had been. For they became at one with all those who heard and understood that God was alive and active in this world and eager that all of them should participate in God's purposes. We need a Pentecost like that. We need a Pentecost like that to blow in and allow the Holy Spirit to overtake us, overtake us with understanding. Nothing will change in our systems or in our lives unless we open ourselves to understanding, unless we begin to listen to understand, not simply listen to have our own opinions and biases validated, but truly listen to understand the experiences of others. So what do we do now? What do we do now and where do we go from here? How can we be part of the hope? And how can we be part of the change? We certainly can't do everything by ourselves, but all of us, all of us can do something. Some of us might be called to protest and have our presence and our voice heard in that way. Others might be called to have individual conversations with people who are different from us. Some might advocate for policy changes by contacting legislators and representatives who are in positions of decision-making. Others might work the election polls and encourage people to vote. And some might have conversations in settings where study and learning can take place about the history and the oppression of racism and about our own biases and questions. When we individually commit ourselves to do something, then together, together we can begin to change the conversation and begin to understand one another and begin to build relationships with one another. Another commitment that all of us can engage in is prayer. Praying not only for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come into the situations that are happening around us, but also praying for God to reveal our biases, to reveal the biases that we hold, and then to repent and turn toward God. Our praying can then lead to action. 
We can pray for the courage and the strength to not speak poorly of other people or speak up when others in our circles are talking in ways that are degrading or speak up when we see something that is wrong and something that is just not right because it's causing harm to another person or people. I wonder if things would have been different if one neighbor, one neighbor on the street where Amon Arbery was jogging had come out and said, this is not okay. I wonder how things might have been different if one of the other three police officers on the scene in Minneapolis had pushed the arresting officer off George Floyd's neck and said, this is not okay. When we can listen, we begin to learn. And so we need to listen and we need to learn. And that might happen by making our circles bigger, making our circles bigger and having more positive contact with people who are different from us. It might happen by working in a shared mission or project with people who are different from us. Or truly listening, listening to the experiences of people of color to help us learn what they experience in life, how they experience life, and the pain that their families have lived with, sometimes for generations. Listening to understand means that we are open to having our opinions and our positions and our biases changed. It comes down to building relationships, which is another basic tenet of our Christian faith. Positive relationships have the power to break down our biases and help us learn. Last Sunday, Sunday, I stood in my yard and talked to my next-door neighbor at a social distance. My neighbors are a black family who have raised two boys who are now young adults in their 20s. I walked across the yard simply to say to them that I was thinking about them during these difficult days. And we ended up talking about all sorts of things and listening to each other. We talked about building relationships, and we talked about what it is like to raise two black boys in Sun Prairie who are now young men. The conversation was appreciated, and it offered insight into experiences that I have never had and experiences that I will never have as a white person. The last action I want to offer to us today is to be intentional. Intentional about looking for the gratitude and the hope in every situation. It is there. And I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the gratitude and the hope. But at the same time, we need to train our minds to look for the gratitude and the hope and not become consumed by the hate and the violence. So often, images of hate and violence dominate the moment. But hate and violence are not representative of most people. And there are just so many images of hope and gratitude that are out there, that are in our communities and are within other people that we need to look for. After peaceful protests in downtown Madison turned destructive last weekend, the next morning, groups of people were working together to clean up and repair the damage. When violence and destruction closed or burned down businesses in Minneapolis that people depend on to get their food, others donated and bagged up mounds and mounds of food and groceries to be given away. When one black man was fearful to even take a walk in his own neighborhood without his child and the family dog with him, others came together and they promised to walk with him. And when listening to understand one another took over, in many cities, police and protesters came together and they walked with one another. So what does all this look like? for the Sun Prairie United Methodist Church, a predominantly white congregation. I don't know what it all looks like, but I desperately want it to look like something, something that honors God and something that shows our love and care for God's people. 
I don't want this to be just a one and done conversation. I don't want this just to be a sermon that I check off as done that. I want us to pray together. I want us to learn together, to engage in ministry and mission together, to build up our communities together, to listen to understand each other, and to worship together with people who are different from us. We are all challenged by difference. When I can truly face that challenge within myself, I often remember something that I learned years ago in Sunday school, the teaching that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. When I can remember that, I know that by the power of the Holy Spirit, difference is part of who we are as children of God, created in the image of God, redeemed by the grace of God, and sustained by the love of God. May it be so for each of us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, as we turn to our time of offering, I invite us to give our gifts to God out of the gratitude of our lives, out of the blessings that God has given us. Each time we take an offering, whether we're in person or whether we send our offering to the church, it truly is an act of worship. It's an act of being grateful for the blessings that we have in our lives. And we do thank each person for the gifts that they are giving to keep our ministry going, to continue to support our staff, and continue to support the ministry that we are doing as the church, as the body of Christ. During this year, which is our 175th anniversary year, we are inviting you to give anniversary gifts for our 175th year. And that might be something of a derivative of 175. It might be $175, it might be $1750, it might be $1,750. Any anniversary gifts that are given during this year, we are putting directly toward our building mortgage to continue to help us be faithful to paying that for the beautiful facility that we are blessed to use as our outpost for ministry. This weekend is also one of the six special offering Sundays in the United Methodist Church, and coming appropriately at this time in, the, in this juncture in our life is the Peace and Justice Sunday. And so any offerings that you give toward Pre Peace and Justice Sunday will be put toward uh, Peace and Justice initiatives within the United Methodist Church, and we thank you for those gifts. You may make your offering by clicking on the Donate button, which is right near where you clicked on to worship or you can mail your offering to the church, or you can drop your offering at the church in our mailbox, which is on the side of our building. And again, we thank you for each offering. 
Our picture today is a picture of some of the gardens and grounds around our church building. Even during these pandemic days, we have had people who have been faithful with their stewardship of their time and their talent to come in individually or at a social distance to be able to care for our grounds and our gardens. And so there's some beautiful peonies that are blooming and some iris that are blooming and glads that are blooming. So there's wonderful flowers around the church. And then this past week, a couple of our faithful stewards had restained the gate around our dumpsters. So that's looking a, a little bit more up, uplifted. And so we thank you for the stewardship of your time and talents as well. Well, now we take time to offer our prayers as we move into a time of sharing communion. And we take prayer requests online on our, on our website, so you can go there and click the prayer request button, or you can email or call the church with any prayer requests, and we'll make sure that we lift those in worship or we send those out over our prayer chain. And then we continue as a faith community to be people of prayer who are praying for one another within our faith community. We're continuing to pray for families and individuals, and we have people who are sending prayer cards to those folks. And each week we try to pray for an area uh, community organization or agency that we are grateful for and that we are praying for. And this coming week, we are praying for the Sun Prairie Area Chorus and other music groups within our community. And we know that the difficult challenges that those groups have not been able to be meeting in the last several months, and it's unknown how long it will be before choirs and music groups can gather together again to make beautiful music. But still, we are offering our gratitude and our prayers for those groups. Other prayers that have come to us this week that I want to either update us on or lift to us. Jane Daniels is making good progress after her fall down the basement stairs, and she left the hospital this last week and is at Oak Park Place on the east side of Madison, a rehabilitation facility where she will be for a while to be able to get stronger and, and do therapy. And Jane very much appreciates our prayers, as does her daughter, Doris Ann, and they uh, thank us for the ways that we are supporting them during this time. Joyce Tepper has gone, from, has gone from the hospital to a rehab facility as well after having emergency surgery for a brain tumor. And they have found that her tumor is at stage four of cancer. So our, our prayers are with Joyce and her husband Leonard and their family during a difficult time. Joyce Wellman took a fall a couple of weeks ago and broke some ribs. She is back home and recuperating now, but our, our healing prayers are with, uh, are with Joyce and, and Gordy during this time. Anne Engel is doing chemotherapy treatments for a reoccurrence of cancer and has asked for our prayers. So our, our prayers are with Anne. Carol Esser took a fall this last week while she and Paul were out hiking and enjoying the beautiful day, and she did break her wrist, a wrist that she has broken before, and she ended up having surgery uh, last weekend, uh, but is home and, and doing well, and, but our healing prayers are with Carol as well. I want to be able to lift up to you Josh Konopecki and Abe Rossmiller. Both of them are in the National Guard, and both of their units have been called up to be in different places around our, our state and country. And so our, our prayers are with Josh and Abe and, and all of those who are in the National Guard or those who are being called to serve. And certainly our continued prayers for all that is transpiring around the uh, killing of George Floyd and the other things that are happening in our country and the protests that are happening and sometimes those protests turning into riots and so our prayers just for that that continues those continued situations and also that God can come upon us that Holy Spirit can come upon us and be able to help us in those conversations that we need to have I do have a gratitude to lift up today and that is last week we delivered 85 hygiene kits that we were putting together and that many of you brought to the church and we delivered those and those will be put to wonderful use in, in places within our state and country that uh, need those health kits. So thank you for those. And now we come together separate but unified in the grace and the presence of the Holy Spirit to share in Holy Communion. And we always remind you that in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate an open communion table, which means whether we're worshiping in one space or whether we're worshiping separately, we invite all people to come to God's table and to be able to share the bread and the cup together. So if you have others with you at home that are with you, I invite you to share communion together, whether you are all United Methodists or whether you are all members of this congregation or not. We come to communion, we come to the table of God's grace out of our own need to know the grace of God's love and the wideness of God's mercy. 
And communion, another name for communion, is Eucharist, which means thanksgiving or gratitude. So it is with that gratitude that I invite us to be in a moment of prayer as we hear the prayer of great thanksgiving. Let us pray. God of mercy and justice, we lift up our hearts to you and give you thanks. You have shared your mercy and justice with us, not only as gifts to be received from you, but as gifts that we are to share with the world. Blessed are you, O God, who created us to love each other and who called us to be in community with one another. You created us in your own image, and when we turned away from your love, you have not deserted us. Time after time, you reached out your hand to touch our lives with loving kindness. You put your words on the lips of men and women who have faithfully given themselves in the struggle for freedom and justice and taught us to sing of your glory. Jesus showed us what a life of mercy and justice looked like. In mercy, he gave food to the hungry. In justice, he broke social customs and shared the same table with the powerful and the lowly. In mercy, he cared for the sick. In justice, he broke religious customs and healed on the Sabbath. In mercy, he had compassion for the poor. In justice, he spoke out against the empire and held who held those in poverty. In mercy, he washed his disciples' feet. In justice, he died without protest to expose a corrupt system. Now we long for a new heaven and a new earth, O God, where there might be peace and justice, and where justice will roll down like water in righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. We thank you, loving God, that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we know you to be our Savior. Send the power of your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. In the eating of this bread and the drinking of this cup, may we know your presence with us. May we become one with you, one with Christ, and one with each other in service to your world. Amen. We are reminded in Scripture that on that night that Jesus gave himself up, he was with his disciples, his friends at the table. They were sharing a meal. And it was almost as if it was a meal of protest against the corrupt system and the corrupt nature that was swirling all around them. But at that meal, when it was over, Jesus took bread from the table. And after giving thanks to God, he broke the bread. And he shared it with his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, the bread of life given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, Scripture reminds us that when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks to God, he shared that with his disciples. And he said, Take and drink. Drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, God's mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we do give ourselves as holy and living witnesses to the hope that God has for this world. It is in gratitude that we share communion together. And now I invite you at your own home to be able to share in the bread and cup with, yourself, with each other or by yourself. And I will take it on our behalf and invite you to take time to share this with one another. The body of Christ, the bread of life, given for you and for all. And the cup of blessing, poured out for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have fed us at this table with this holy mystery. Now grant that we'd go from our separate places into the world in which you love to give ourselves for others. Help us to experience life with others and help us to share your love with all that we meet. We pray this in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Our closing song today after communion is a beautiful song that was written by the Reverend DeAndre Johnson. 
And he actually wrote the words of this song in 2016 and have re has re-sung them just last week as a powerful protest to what is going on in our country and our world right now. So I invite you to hear these words of Reverend Johnson. Hasty crusades 
Even in these continued days of being separate from one another, we have a lot happening within the life of our church, and we do invite you to go to our church website to see what is happening and see if there, you can find ways where you can connect into the life of the church. If you would like to receive our weekly Thursday email, which tells things happening within our faith community, and also our devotional Monday devotion of the, our word of the week, if you do not receive those already, you may contact the church office, and we will get those sent to you. Also, you will want us to join us for worship next weekend as we continue this series of being challenged by difference. And next week will be our reconciling weekend, a weekend that we celebrate being a reconciling church. And so we do invite you to join us and invite others to be with you as well. Also, next weekend on Saturday and Sunday, we will have another one of our food drives. And this time it will be for our Sun Prairie Food Pantry, which is now accepting non-perishable food and personal hygiene items again. And we will specifically be focusing on the things that they need to put together boxes of food for our senior citizens in our community. So if you go to our church website, there is a list there of things that they are particularly looking for. But any non-perishable food or personal hygiene items will be much appreciated. And that drive will be on both Saturday and Sunday. Saturday, it will be from 10 to noon here at the church. You can just pull up, and uh, there will be people here to help unload things for you. Or on Sunday, it will be between 1 and 3. That will be June 13th and 14th. Well, now may we continue in this day as people of faith who know the creating, redeeming, and sustaining love of God as we share the love of God as we go out and we share the redeeming grace of the risen Christ, and as we know the sustaining strength of the Holy Spirit in our lives. May we have the courage to live this day as God's grateful people. Amen. <laughs>